I want to preach tonight um, a word, a message called the Spirit and the Word. And I felt like God kind of put it on my heart two weeks ago to talk to the church, and I felt like God really pressed it on my heart to talk to the church about the Word, the Word of God. How many know there is nothing more needed and necessary in our culture and in our world today than the Word of God? and believers that know the Word of God. The Bible says that all Scripture, somebody say all Scripture. All Scripture, all scripture is profitable. All Scripture is profitable for preaching and teaching. We need every single page and every single word and every single line of this book, and it needs to be more than just a book to us, but it needs to be written upon our hearts. Amen? Amen. There is power in the Word of God. The Bible says it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Not only that, but the Word of God, this is like a living and breathing book. It's actually not a book. It's a library of books spanning thousands of years, written by many men who are under the Spirit of God, who were led by the Spirit of God, who wrote under the direction and the conviction of the Spirit of God, who spoke about things that nobody else in their period of time, nobody else in their age had that kind of knowledge and wisdom and insight And so it was beyond them, it was beyond normal, it was beyond man, it was the Spirit of God speaking to men. And they wrote this incredible, incredible book that's more than just a book. In this book, there are 64,000 cross-references, 64,000 times the Bible cross-references itself, 64,000 times where it connects Scripture to and from and to and from. This is a living, breathing book, and when you connect with it, when you put your face in it, and when you read it, it's not just a story you're reading to yourself. It's not just another C.S. Lewis novel or another uh, J.R. Tolkien novel. It's not anything like that. It is a living, breathing word that when you connect with it, it is serving as an interface hear me, between you and God. And so when I connect with the Word of God, I am connecting with God Himself. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And so when I connect and I have the words of God and the Word of God in my heart, I come to know God. The Word of God is not just an option. It's not just a great thing to have in your life. It's not just a good thing to do before you go to bed at night and half you fall asleep reading it. The Word of God is something that is needed and vital in this world today. Can I get an amen? amen. And so the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, does anybody got it? Can you say amen? amen. Uh, this is a story of Jesus when he's being tempted, and uh, he goes out into the desert. And you all know the story, but I want to use it tonight to kind, of, to kind of preach it in a new way, hopefully you haven't heard before. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Someone say, yeah, that makes sense. All right. And when they were ended, he was hungry. So the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Verse 9, he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Come on, are you with me tonight? Four times. And Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified and all. So it's an incredible story in the Bible. Jesus is tempted for 40 days in the desert and, uh, and I want to use it tonight to preach from this thought, the spirit and the word. Come on, can you just give God a praise for a moment tonight? I wonder before we go in, I just feel like we need to like just kind of like, like, like turn the soil for a second a little bit longer. Can you just lift your hand? You can stay seated and do this. Lift your hands all over this place. Just give God the glory all over this room. Father, we thank you for your presence and your power tonight. We thank you for your word that never returns void. God, let each and every heart be touched. Let each, let each and every person receive. In Jesus' name, Spirit, speak to us what you would have us to hear tonight. And we'll give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Come on, and all God's people sit. And give the Lord one more shout of praise. Amen. 
So there's a bad habit in amongst believers today in the church today that confuses suggestions in the word of God for commands in the word of God or confuses commands for suggestions. And I want you to know that Jesus never suggested anything. He commanded everything. Are you with me? He never suggested anything. He commanded everything. And when you look at the word of God and the words of God as suggestions, what you're saying is they're optional. They become more like supplements rather than ingredients. I know, I know if you're baking anything to get to the right results, you have to have the right ingredients. If you don't have the right ingredients, you won't have the right result. But so often we look at the principles of the word of God and the commandments in the word of God as if they're suggestions and supplements. In other words, they're things that I can add to my life to make my life better, but are not necessary are not needed. It's another thing that's good for me. I've discovered that Jesus, when he spoke and when he taught and when the Holy Spirit speaks and when the word of God speaks, it's never because he wants to make our lives just a little bit better. It's because he is giving us what is absolutely necessary and what is absolutely needed for us to do the things that he has called us to do and to be the thing that he has called us to be. Can I get an amen? Amen. And so God doesn't suggest anything. He doesn't write. He didn't come to the earth to write a best-selling novel. This isn't seven habits of highly effective people. This isn't five keys to prosper. This isn't another good podcast. It's not chicken soup for the teenage soul. It's none of that. What God puts in his word is everything you need and must obey to live and to prosper and to do what he's called you to do. It's not an option. He said, this is not one way. Watch me. He said, this is not one way of many ways. He said, said, I am the way. He didn't say this is one truth of many truths. This is one thing you could do or one thing you could try or one thing you could put, you can insert into your habits or insert into your schedule. He said, this is the way walk ye in it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way but through me, but through what I'm saying, but through what I'm telling you. I am it. Amen. Are you following me tonight? So there is no other way. You can't get there from another best-selling book. You can't get there from another novel. You can't get there from another good podcast. You must do it the way God said to do it. You must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You must adhere to the word of God, and you must do what God has told us to do. That's the difference between supplements and ingredients. It's not vitamin C so I can get through or feel a little better. And that's what happens so often when we look at the word as a supplement rather than necessary is we go to it when we feel like it's needed, but we don't have it in our lives each and every day. See, if you recognize that it's needed just to live, I mean, you drink water every day because you know that you can't go long without it. He said, I am the the, living water. I am going to put a living well on the inside of you. And so sometimes we look at it as a supplement. Like when I remember every three months, maybe, maybe I should take a vitamin C. I mean, no, I don't take vitamin C every day. You know when I take like a high C or emergency or a vitamin C? You know when I start eating well? When my kids get sick. Then I'm like, baby, I got to watch my diet. I can't get sick. So it's not a supplement, it's an ingredient. The word of God is not something I insert in my life when I feel like I need it or I feel, a, need a, feel like I need a boost in my confidence or maybe it's what, I, it's what I put into my life when I make a mistake and when I stumble and I need to remove this feeling of guilt and conviction and shame. Or maybe I go to the word when, when a, a really good message is preached and then I feel the conviction and I, and I start getting in my Bible again. No, it is all day. It is every day. It is your entire life. This is a, this is a everything or nothing kind of gospel. Now, God's got grace for you. When you fall, when you stumble, when you walk away, when you miss it, when you make a mistake, he's got grace from you. You can run a thousand times, a thousand miles for a thousand years and God still got love and grace for you to bring you back. But hear me, what he wants for you is to have consistent and constant relationship with him. And if you want to know what God wants with you, he wants with you what he had with Adam and what Adam forfeited for the fruit of the tree. He wants to walk with you and talk with you like he walked with Adam in the, in, in, in the, in, in the cool of the day. He wants to interface with you. He wants to connect with you. He wants to know you and be known by you. 
But so often we trade the conveniences of life and the things that we have to do or feel we have to do and neglect the thing that is the very most important. But I promise you, if you will get into the word, if you will get into the spirit, if you will remain in prayer, come on somebody, if you will stay in the word, if you will read it and devour it, the Bible says we eat the word of God. We devour the word of God. I promise you, you will find something in the word of God that you will never, ne you can look all over this world and you will never find what you could find in a single passage of scripture. This word is alive and it's sharp and it's living and we need it in our culture today. We need it in the church today. We need it in the world today. We need it in the life of believers. Amen. So if you're driving home tonight and uh, on your way home, red and blue lights go on behind you and, and you're not going to turn to your wife in the car and be like, what do you think? Should we pull over or should we go for it? You ever thought about it, men, men especially, you ever thought about it for just like a split second? You're just like, man, I know you have, you got that, you got that fast car, I know. You thought about it for a second, then you remember, man, I drive a Honda Pilot, I'm not getting very far. So, when the red and blue lights go on behind you, you don't question, you don't view it as a suggestion, you recognize it as a command, why? Because you recognize who it is putting on the red and blue lights and you recognize that they have authority. And so because they have authority, you submit to the command. Now hear me, Jesus, the Bible says, has all authority. So why don't we submit to his commands? Is anybody, like, I mean, Well, how can he have all authority? All authority belongs to Jesus. And so, and, and there are a thousand commands that the church fails to keep every day, that believers fail to keep each and every day. How is it that all authority belongs to Jesus and I have so many options for what I could do? The, the red and blue lights are going on behind us and the church is saying, ah, maybe I'll just let this ride out for a while. Or maybe I'll see how long I can get away with it. And I'm going to tell you something. You must submit and come under authority because if you don't, you will never, ever be able to walk in authority. It is impossible, watch me, to walk in authority and to have authority in your life if you do not first come under authority in Jesus' name. And so, and so I, I love this because some, so often in, in, in our, in our uh ideas about Jesus in our, in our perception of Jesus. We view him as someone, uh, we see him as the suffering servant, right? That's an idea about who Jesus is. He went to the cross. You know what the Bible says in John chapter 19? That standing before, standing before Herod and standing before Pontius Pilate, what did Jesus say? He said, I want you to know that the only reason you're allowed to do this, oh my goodness, I love this so much. The only reason you're allowed to do this right now, the, oh man, the only reason and this, the only reason you put this crown of thorns in my head, the only reason you're about to take me to that cross, the only reason that I have 39 lashes on my back, the only reason is because my Father has authorized you. I have all authority and all dominion and all power. It belongs to me. Ah, somebody help me tonight. Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Never forget that when he went up to that cross, the only reason he was there is because he allowed himself to be there. Never forget that he could have called down angel armies to pull him off of that cross and wipe out every one of his accusers, but he chose to be there for you and me. Never forget that all authority and blessing and honor and dominion and power belongs to Jesus Christ. Most of the work that Jesus did, most of the work that Jesus did was convincing the disciples, most of his ministry was spent convincing the, the disciples that he had the authority of God. What he said, he said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. All of heaven's authority, I have. All of the dominion over this entire earth, I have it. It was the most abstract and difficult idea for the disciples to adopt. They, they, they struggled with it. They couldn't understand it. They kept saying, what did they say? They said, they said, Jesus, if you just let us talk right to the Father, that would be great. He said, he said I and the Father are one. I am the Father. Like, when you look at me, you're looking at the exact, the Bible says, image and likeness of God. Amen. And still the disciple says, well, 
can you just, you just let us verify that with God? Let's just check with him and then we'll make sure. So half of the work Jesus did was convincing him that he truly was the Messiah. One of the boldest statements in all the Bible is when Peter looked at Jesus and they say, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Moses, some say you're this other, some say you're a prophet, some say you're a good teacher, but who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the son of, the first, the first man to ever confess it, the first man to ever speak it. He said, you are the Messiah. Come on, are you with me tonight? And so, and so all authority, all dominion, and all power belongs to Jesus. And I wish we would recognize this when we look out into culture. You know there's not a single person in this world sitting in political office that has not been authorized by God. The only reason, every, you look at the highest and lofty, I didn't say they're blessed by God. I just said that, that they're authorized by God. All power that is exercised in this world has been authorized by God. Nothing happens unless God has authorized it and allowed it. He is still absolutely 100% in control. I preached this last time I preached, but, but 30 seconds after Adam and Eve bit the apple, he already, he was still, help me somebody, he was still in control. He already had a plan for a Messiah. He already had a plan for a, for a Savior. There hasn't been a moment in all of human history where God has surrendered his authority he is the authority in Jesus' name. And so do you, I mean, you, never, you never have a reason to be fearful. You never have a reason to be scared. We don't draw our authority from people. We don't draw our authority from men. I don't draw my authority from gifts or talents or abilities or anything like that. I draw my authority from God. He is my strength in Jesus' name. And so to walk in authority, I first have to come under authority and I submit to authority. I, I, I mean, one of the greatest things in my life, one of my greatest shelters in my life is layers of authority. You see, authority in your life takes the hits before you, can, you even know that someone was swinging at you. Authority in my life, my parents have taken hits that belong to me. Come on, are you with me tonight? I come under, one of the greatest things in my life is that I can come under some authority. And if you don't got any authority in your life, man, it's about time you started recognizing that authority is not a curse, it's a blessing. They can shape you and mold you and develop you into something that you're not right now. Quit cursing the authorities in your life and start thanking God for them in Jesus' name. And so, I'm moving on. In Luke chapter 4, we find Jesus, and this is immediately after he has been baptized, immediately after uh, he has this confirmation moment. This is like, this is like, I mean, this is like a bat mitzvah and a sweet 16 and everything like that all rolled into one. This is the moment where everybody recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the moment he goes down in the Jordan River. He's baptized by John the Baptist. A voice open helps from heaven. A dove descends and confirms, this is my son. This is him. This is the Christ. This, there's no, this is who the prophets spoke about. This is Jesus the Messiah. Turn the page, and on the very next page, we find out that the Spirit of God has propelled him and pushed him. The Bible actually says in, in the Gospel of Mark, it says it drove him out into the wilderness. So the Spirit of God drives him out into the wilderness, and in the wilderness, he is tempted for 40 days. And there's two rounds of temptation. He's tempted for 40 days by the devil, and then at the end of 40 days, the second round of temptation begin. Are you with me tonight? And so the enemy, watch me, the enemy wants to steal the joy out of your victories. So Jesus has this moment. He's baptized in the Jordan River. It's a moment of confirmation. Everybody's seeing you are the son of God. And then immediately the spirit of God drives him out into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, the enemy tempts him. The enemy wants to steal the joy out of every time God touches you, every God, time God moves, you, moves in your life, everything God does in your life. The moment after it happens, you better realize that that is the moment where the enemy is going to jump on you. I've seen this. I've seen this. I've seen this. I, one of my the great inspirations of my life is Charles Spurgeon. I read all of his writings and read all of his letters. He writes extensively on this, that right after the, God touches you, right after the spirit, right after the greatest 
times in, in God, right after you receive something in God at these altars, right after you're confirmed, right after God does something special in your life, those are the moments where the enemy is going to try to jump on you. He's going to try immediately to kill what God was just doing, to put doubt in your heart and doubt in your mind. And that's exactly what he's doing for Jesus, uh, to Jesus. He's trying to discourage him from this moment. You're not really the son of God. You're not really who you say you are. All the lies that the enemy must have told in those 40 days to keep him from fulfilling his calling. Ultimately, that's all the enemy wants to do. He is, wants to keep the will of God from coming to a reality in your life. Amen. But how many know you can't give the enemy a foothold? Right. There's a way that you can go 40 days in the wilderness and still resist the enemy. Come on, are you with me tonight? There's a way, I'm going to say it to make sure you're there. There's a way that you can endure each and every temptation, each and every battle, it is possible, Jesus shows this, to endure massive amounts of temptation. It is possible to endure anything and everything the enemy throws at you. My dad said it like this. He used to say it all the time when I was growing up. He said, if you can go one minute with, without sinning, you can go one hour without sinning. And if you can go an hour without sinning, you might be able to go a day without sinning. You see, sinning, sinning is not something you have to do. Sinning is not something you're condemned to do. Are you with me? Acts of sin, acts of, acts of sin are not something that you have to do. It's not something that you could say, I'll allow it because I'm predestined to do it. No, that's not true. But God has given you the power to resist temptation. God has given you the power to resist doubt and fear and worry and unbelief. And if you will believe that the power of God in you is great enough to overcome the world around you, you will discover that you can go into the deserts, you can go into the wilderness, you can take steps of faith into places you've never been, and everything the enemy tries out there and every lie he throws at you is overcome by the truth that you know and so the spirit of God sends him out into the desert he attacks him for 40 days now now bear with me I, I want to take a moment I want to kind of lay some foundation for a minute the primary reason that Jesus came to the earth that God sent his son was not for the forgiveness of sins I didn't get any help in there because y'all aren't y'all aren't sure yet you know, like what? The primary reason that, that Jesus went to the cross was not for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, why would Jesus spend three years ministering, developing disciples, training them up, ministering, performing miracles, and doing all of these things if at the end of the day all he needed to do was die? He could have just come to the earth, told a few people about him, and done it like Abraham when he took Isaac up on the mountain. He could have just gone up there and said, someone kill me. He could have done like that if all he had to do was die. But Jesus didn't come to earth just to, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came to earth, and here it is, for the establishment of a kingdom. He came to the earth for the establishment of a kingdom. Now, people like to think that Jesus is all New Testament, and God is the God of the Old Testament. But I'm going to tell you tonight, Jesus was not in the New Testament for very long. In fact, Jesus is more of an Old Testament figure than he is a New Testament figure. So in case you're ever like, well, I don't really like that Old Testament God, you better realize you have an Old Testament Jesus. Not only is, not only is he in the Old Testament, he's in every book of the Old Testament. What did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come to bring a new covenant. I came to ratify and fulfill the Old Covenant. That's what Jesus said. I came to fulfill. I came to bring this story to a conclusion. And the new covenant, watch me, it doesn't begin with my teachings. It begins with my blood. So the kingdom is established. The first cornerstone, watch me, the first cornerstone is laid, not with Jesus' good teachings, not with what Jesus had to say, but by the blood of Jesus being spilt, the kingdom of God is established. The prophet says, see, I am laying a stone in Zion, a cornerstone. And Jesus is the cornerstone, the first block that went on the ground in the kingdom of God was Jesus Christ by the cross of Calvary and by the spilt blood of Jesus. Are you with me? And so the cornerstone has been laid, and the cornerstone is for the building of an eternal kingdom. Now, Jesus doesn't establish his kingdom at the return of Christ. Jesus' kingdom is already established. Right? He's not a, the kingdom is not established when he comes back. The kingdom is established, and it is being completed. So if Jesus isn't here... 
Who is, this is really simple, who's completing the kingdom? Come on. That is our, so Jesus' job was to lay the cornerstone, and my job is to lay the other stones. And Jesus isn't coming back to put a throne. Oh man, I like this. Jesus isn't coming back to put a throne on a cornerstone. That would look pretty dinky. He is coming to put a throne in a kingdom. Come on, somebody. So we have a mission and a mandate that is to build the kingdom of God. Meaning I am preparing the kingdom wherein God will be seated on his throne. Y'all are helping me tonight. I am preparing. That's my mission. That's my mandate to build the kingdom. Now, I, I, I figured out that, that you know, Jesus, Jesus said, uh, or, or Paul said, sorry, he has brought us, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, he has brought us out from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of the sun. So Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Kingdoms are established through conquest. Kingdoms aren't established because we all sat and said, hey, what if, we, what if we did our own thing and they did their thing? No, that's not how we establish kingdoms. Kingdoms are established through conquest. Kingdoms are established by level what was there and create something new. And so Jesus didn't come, Jesus didn't come to occupy with the enemy. Jesus didn't come to occupy. He, when he comes back, when he re- returns, he's returning, the Bible says, for a spotless bride and an everlasting kingdom. Come on. And so in order to build a kingdom, another kingdom needs to be torn down. And in his blood, the Bible says he stole the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And the kingdom of God was established. What's amazing to me is the kingdom of God was established with a single cornerstone named Jesus Christ. It didn't take an army. All the Jews, they wanted a a military conqueror. They They were conflating the idea of their opposition, the opposition that Jesus spoke about, the enemy that Jesus spoke about, the kingdom. They were conflating it with conflating it with the Roman Empire and they were misidentifying their enemy but Jesus said you're not going to battle with flesh and blood but our battle is with spirits and principalities come on are you with me and so and so the kingdom of God wasn't about uh, wasn't about uh, getting getting Rome out of Jerusalem like the disciples wanted it wasn't about anything like that Jesus said I came to build an everlasting kingdom and today we are the foot soldiers in the kingdom of God now if the kingdom is established y'all good uh, work with, say with me, well, track with me as I'm going here. The kingdom is being established, but it is being completed. And the Bible is clear. Jesus will not return until the kingdom is, is, established, is, is fully complete. He is, he, is, he is allowing for the maximum amount of people to come to know him before his return. So who really is in control of the return of Christ. Come on. I I love how we deflect. I mean, I I shouldn't say I love. I don't like how we deflect as believers everything onto God and forget that we have a vital role in the kingdom of God. We have a vital role in, in the story of God. That is, we are the body of Christ. We have a mission and a mandate to build the kingdom of God, to see his throne established, an everlasting kingdom. Now, the kingdom is established in, in his blood, and when Jesus Christ hung on the cross and said, it is finished, a cornerstone was laid. Now, now you remember Peter in the Bible. Of course you remember Peter. I preach on Peter a lot. Peter, Peter was so weak at times that on the day his messiah is being crucified a little girl runs to peter and says don't you know him isn't that isn't that isn't that the messiah that you walked with and peter now peter was a fisherman on the sea of galilee peter walked on water once peter had the faith to say jesus you are the messiah he had all he had the faith to do all that but in front of this little girl he cannot confess he cannot bring himself to have the bravery and the courage to say that is my messiah they're crucifying up on the hill that is my jesus that the, i i ate with him and i drank with him that is my jesus i laughed with him for years i've walked with him he brought me out onto the water that's jesus who brought me out out of my ordinary life and off the boat into this entirely new revelation that's jesus who saw something in me then that I didn't see in myself. That's my savior. That's my God up on that hill. But when the little girl runs to him, he doesn't have the courage to say, yes, I know him. Oh man, people are fickle. Are you with me tonight, church? 
But it wasn't too long after that, that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in the upper room, he became something different than what he had ever been before. He would travel throughout the known world. He would preach the gospel in England and all throughout Asia. He would travel all over the world. He would establish the church. He would build the church. He would figure out doctrinal disputes. He would, uh, he would be persecuted and suffering. He'd go without food and water and a place to rest. He'd live to see his children die for the gospel that he preached. All 12 disciples were beaten, executed, exiled, and, and boiled in, in oil and crucified. But never once in all of that, somebody help me tonight, never once in all of that did they change their tune or change their story. I don't think we got five believers in the world like this today, but never once in all of that persecution, in years of suffering, in years of never having enough, not a place to lay their head, not a place to rest their head, persecution and suffering all around them, never once did they say, we made it up. Never once did they change their story. Never once did they say, I, I can get out of this if I deny him again. But the man who couldn't stand up to the girl went to a cross too. And when he went to a cross, he said, turn the cross upside down for I'm not worthy of dying in the same way as my savior. There was something in them that wasn't in them before. There was something in them that wasn't in them when they walked with Jesus. It was the power of the Holy Spirit and it turned them into something that they weren't. Come on, somebody. To their dying breaths, they never said, we made it up. To their dying breath, they never forgot. They never backed down on the story because they knew. They knew they saw the stone rolled away. They knew they saw the nail holes in his hand. They put their fingers in him to make sure they saw what Jesus did. I wonder, I wonder, do we have five believers in the world, in this room, and even in the world? Do we have five believers, do you think, that could, that could withstand that kind of trial and that kind of tribulation and keep to faith and run and not grow weary and run to the very end? The Spirit of God puts power on your life that is beyond normal, that is beyond what is, is normal in the natural. And the Spirit of God took ordinary men off of boats, it took tax collectors and fishermen, and it turned them into mighty warriors that turned the whole world upside down for Jesus. In fact, the Bible says that they would see them preaching and teaching, and they, they would know that they had been with Jesus because their courage and their boldness, boldness was so extraordinary. I'm preaching tonight to help you understand that the Spirit of God and the Word of God, but the Spirit of God for a moment, is not a supplement in your life. It is necessary in your life. I said it's necessary in your life. It's not something that you can get through much longer. You're not going to be able to run in the things of God. You might have enough to get into heaven, but it's the Spirit of God that God intended for you to have so that you can be more than just a, a saved person, so you can be more than just getting to heaven, but so that you could be a kingdom builder. Now, it occurs to me that most believers today have enough to get to heaven, but don't have enough to build the kingdom. They have enough to get to heaven, but they're not contributing to the kingdom. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just lay a stone. The Bible says we are living stones. So we each lay our stones in the kingdom of God set off from the cornerstone. But I don't want to just lay a stone. I want to build a skyscraper in the kingdom of God. Come on, I want there to be blocks in the kingdom of God that wouldn't be there had Brandon Billsboro not fulfilled his calling. That wouldn't be there if Brandon Billsboro didn't step into the faith. That Brandon Billsboro, if he didn't run, if he didn't run, if he didn't give his very life and his very essence and everything he had towards it. Do you want that church? Because it means there's a mandate and there's a mission that you're going to have to fulfill. Now, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that Jesus had the spirit of God. John chapter three, verse 34 tells us Jesus had the spirit of God without measure. So Jesus didn't have some of the spirit of God. Jesus had all of the Spirit of God. Now, Bible says also each person is given a measure of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that draws people to repentance, right? So each person, each and every sinner, has a, has a measure of the Holy Spirit in them, and it's enough to draw them to repentance. Jesus didn't have a measure. Jesus didn't even have a lot. Jesus had all of it. 
So all of the Holy Spirit, all of the anointing that could be had was had by Jesus. Now Christ, Jesus Christ, and I don't want to insult your intelligence here, but Christ is not Jesus' last name. Christ means that he was the anointed one. The anointed one. Now in the Old Testament, y'all tracking? Y'all okay? In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come on men for a moment and for a purpose. So the Spirit of God would rest on a David, it would rest on an Elijah, it would rest on someone so that they could fulfill something in the will of God. And then when it was done, it would leave them. But when in the New Testament, the Spirit of God is made available to each and every one of us. So the Spirit of God was on Jesus without measure. Now, Christ means the anointed one. So he is, God's, he is the anointed servant. He, is the, the, he carries all the anointing in the world today. But the Bible says, watch me, John chapter 16, verse 13, that the Spirit of God will lead us into all truth. So all knowledge and all wisdom comes from the Spirit of God. So when Jesus had the Spirit of God and the anointing on him, he didn't know some things. He wasn't a smart guy. He knew all things. The disciples were like, no one's ever spoken to like you before. No one's ever spoken in parables. Like, no one's ever spoken like this before. It's because he, has, he had all knowledge and all wisdom because he had all truth, because he had all of the Spirit. All the anointing that could be had. Now, the Bible tells us that no anointing, no blessing, no anointing ever leaves the earth. So when people go up, right now, death has a 100% success rate. So when people, except, except for maybe Elijah and Jesus, right? But, but everybody else has died. So when people go up, the anointing stays. Are you, okay, okay. So when people go up, the anointing stays, which means there's more to grab. Does that make sense? Which means there's more to be had. So when Jesus carried all anointing, so everybody else had some dimin- had some spirit. David had some spirit. Elijah had a measure of the spirit. Moses had the spirit. Uh, they had some spirit on them, but Jesus had all of the Holy Spirit on him. All the anointing, all of the, and with all the anointing, all of the wisdom and knowledge that could possibly be had, Jesus had all of it. And so when he went up and ascended, he said, I must go, why? So that my Holy Spirit can come on you. So when he went up and ascended, Jesus ascended, but the anointing remained. I wish somebody would get it in their spirit tonight. So why, shortly thereafter, would 120 gather in an upper room and be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead was left on the earth when he went back. He said, I'm going, but something is staying and I'm keeping it here for you. And I may have laid the kingdom down with, a, with my blood, but I'm keeping something here that's gonna empower you to do everything that I did and more.